So good afternoon. Welcome to this, the second of our Northeast Business Futures event um, sponsored by the North Star Foundation. This is a, a series of events on the topics of healthcare and information technology, which are the two areas that the school specializes in. Uh, for those of you who don't know about UTCs, their main um, distinctive feature is close ties with business. And we have very strong partnership with businesses and the NHS. I'm very proud of the school, it's doing well, particularly um, during this difficult time where all the students are at home and we have a very good distance learning program in place as befits the school which um, focuses on information technology. I'd like to thank Accenture uh, for putting this on, Mark in particular and Chris and Tamana who've done the technical side of this. I'd like to thank Matthew Swindell, uh, a former Deputy Chief Executive of NHS England, um, for joining us and, and giving our main uh, presentation. Um, and that said, um, I'd like to pass on now to, to Mark. Thanks very much, Michael. Uh, hope uh, and welcome everyone. It, I'm delighted to be able to join you today uh, and I hope you enjoy this session. Accenture are proud to be um, supporters of the UTC uh, and think it's um, very important that uh, technology and healthcare are championed from an educational point of view, given how important those topics are um, to the future of industry companies and individuals everywhere. Um, all around the world, we're seeing a lot of change at the moment, and of course, nearly every conversation is dominated by COVID. The, the purpose of the session today, though, is to maybe look beyond that at what um, is being catalyzed and accelerated in the healthcare sector and some of the opportunities that that brings. Um, because although there is challenge, we're also seeing some incredible achievements, both by individuals like um, Colonel Tom raising many millions of pounds, but also teams and organizations collaborating to um, achieve um, great things in a very short period of time. And although it may be unpopular to say, we're also seeing governments moving at an unprecedented pace as well, and sometimes achieving things in days and weeks that previously would have taken uh, months and years. Um, I'll just start in, in terms of the, these um, introductory points, maybe talking about some of the trends that we as Accenture are seeing uh, globally, um, uh, both the result of this pandemic, but also what that's accelerating and enabling in terms of future change. Um, the first one, and maybe an obvious one that um, will be familiar with everyone, is just the volume of individuals who are now working from home or working remotely. We've got millions and millions of people all around the globe who've maybe moved from roles where they never really thought they would be able to work from home and are now achieving that um, um, to a, and to a large degree successfully. In, in Accenture as a company, we've got half a million people approximately who are now remote working using Teams um, and we help support the NHS transition 1.2 million people um, onto Teams in the space of uh, just over a week. Um, and that was something that would have been planned normally over ma uh, many months, uh, but was achieved through necessity, which is, I guess, a lesson in itself. We've got schools, of course, um, adopting remote classrooms. And again, things that, again, were moving potentially quite slowly have moved at a really uh, rapid pace. And now schools are looking at um, what the future might hold if those sorts of um, learning techniques and remote working is successful. Um, what part can it play in the curriculum going forward? But as well as working from home, we've also got people who have been forced to change roles. So some uh, work has dried up um, and then people are retraining or being moved to other areas of either their own businesses or sometimes moving um, into other areas as well. So um, we saw that Papa John's in the US, the uh, pizza chain, we're recruiting 20,000 people, largely from the hotel sector because of the uh, uptick in demand for pizzas that was seen as everyone was working from home and wanted remote delivery or local delivery. Um, but 
there are implications in terms of uh, changing working patterns and we're still getting to grips with um, how does working from home impact people in terms of maybe their their balance of life and in the longer term um, can that actually be helpful for things like uh, uh, mental health and engagement of people in in companies because they have that um, flexibility and then there's wider implications if you've got uh, companies that previously had city centre offices now having the majority of their staff working from home then maybe those expensive city centre buildings could be closed down or reduced in terms of size and demand that then has knock-on um, impact in terms of um, house prices in the area in terms of transport and the use of transport to get to your work location but then also for retail and shopping outlets that um, sit alongside those big um, urban hubs and we're seeing and then and can also have implications for things like tourism so something that starts as just a change in terms of the way people are working can then um, transform other industries as well another trend we're seeing is just the the pace of uh, cooperation uh, and the acceleration that that's uh, bringing so I'll give an example in in Norway uh, a new benefit was um, uh, derived created um, revised and implemented in the space of three weeks and typically if an, uh, a benefit to pay for people was um, uh, was discussed in historically then it would have taken maybe 12 to 18 months to be able to turn that into a policy and then translate it into something that was implemented so we're seeing some really amazing accelerations uh, as a result of the, the kind of the uh, forces that are at play at the moment you know similarly that in India uh, you know a country of 1.3 billion people um, the Indian government wanted um, guidance to be available via a, uh, a virtual assistant or a web chat um, on their uh, digital site their national digital site uh, and again something that would have taken many months actually was developed in the matter of a few days and implemented within three weeks to the full population so just an incredible pace um, we've seen public and private companies collaborate to try and speed up the delivery of ventilators we've got um, distilleries that are turning their hand to producing um, uh, gel um, antiseptic gel so the innovation is being driven through necessity uh, a further um, trend we're seeing is that the one towards virtualization and contactless processes and what I mean by that is where previously people would have thought that physical ceremonies were essential so things like um, let's say virtual courts or, or court processing people would often think that you'd have to get all of the participants together into the same physical space in order to be able to conduct say a magistrate's hearing um, we're now seeing because of the backlog um, caused by the crisis um, we're seeing a much more willingness to adopt video conferencing as a mechanism to get through some types of um, court hearings um, and that can have other benefits in too in terms of um, uh, preventing the need for people to travel the security associated with that and also the welfare of people who are appearing who maybe are, would be very stressed by that that physical appearance but can are more comfortable um, doing it um, uh, uh, virtually um, those same principles are being uh, adopted for things like again uh, benefit assessment so where previously someone might have to go and do a face-to-face -face interview in order to say that they're eligible for a benefit um, there's a greater acceptance now that maybe those um, discussions could occur uh, virtually and alongside the virtualization there's then people wanting to focus on um, contactless processes so not wanting to go into areas where there's lots of other people and in particular not wanting to say touch things which maybe lots of other people have touched so uh, an example of that would be um, bus services which now can use um, gestures rather than people physically pressing buttons in order to say that you want off at the next stop or more complex examples like um, the border controls processing where rather than people having to put their fingerprints down um, and repeatedly do that in a queue they'll use other biometrics um, for example facial scanning and whilst doing that um, process 
um, we're now seeing interest in people putting um, health scanning alongside the facial scanning, so being able to check people's temperatures to be able to see if perhaps they're well or unwell at the point that they're um, they're crossing the border. So a lot of different implications in terms of that kind of contactless technology. Um, and then finally, uh, a whole load of technologies which were getting purchased but are now maybe being speeded up. So new technologies like the use of virtual assistants, uh, robotic process automation, um, virtual agents, artificial intelligence, machine learning. So all of these new technologies where previously manual processes were starting to be automated, where uh, human interactions maybe for low value work um, and low value um, interactions with customers can now be done via a chatbot. They're now being accelerated and the discussion is now more around where is it best to use um, the high value skilled people that we have in a workforce um, and use them for the, the interaction with other people where that empathy is needed and that expertise and subtlety is required um, and use those automation and machine learning style technologies in areas where it's low value, repetitive, more transactional um, uh, processes and that it's a balance of those two things together which will be successful in the longer term. Um, but there's an opportunity to move towards some of those models now. Now, I'll also say we could do a whole other topic on privacy and, the, and the, the implications of these sorts of technologies on the use of data and people's permissions uh, and allowing people to use their own data. Um, and suffice to say, there's a whole load of an, at, attention on making sure we don't step too fast and too far um, uh, from that privacy angle. But it's no doubt that there's those uh, trends that I describe are really coming to the fore now and companies are looking forward and going they don't want to return to the models that they previously had and that they now want to see whether they can accelerate and actually move to new ways of working and that's um, got to be a positive outcome of what's kind of quite a terrible situation. And perhaps you know, somewhere where that's particularly important is the the uh, the health sector where that combination of personal connection and empathy and the bond between physicians and, and patients is vital, but also technology plays a massive part, not just from, a, from the point of view of medical equipment, but also the opportunity to improve processes and to improve the experience of, of um, patients as they move through the system. Um, and just to illustrate that, I'll just um, ask Tamana to play us a, a, a short video and then we can um, step after that into a, a discussion with our, our, our guest speaker.
can step now to mine and we'll move through to the um, the key speaker, Matthew Swindells. I'd just like to do a quick, quick introduction to Matthew and thank him for joining us. As uh, Michael mentioned, he's the former uh, Deputy Chief Executive of NHS England. He's also been an advisor in the Prime Minister's office and a senior policy advisor to the Secretary of State for Health. And as a um, approaching 30 years in healthcare services and public and private sector. So, you know, welcome, Matthew, and really appreciate you uh, uh, joining us today. Um, maybe if I uh, uh, kick off with a, the first question, uh, topically, um, given our, our title today, Dr. Robot will uh, see you now. Um, where do you think we are in relation to kind of that reality? Do you think there's it's hype and it's quite a long way away and the reality is more mundane or or do you actually do you see us taking huge steps towards that uh, more modern future? Well, thanks very much and thanks for the opportunity to uh, to be here and for people uh, uh, giving up their precious Netflix time to uh, to join us on this uh, on, on, on this call. Um, I think the uh, the reality, and if we've got the next slide uh, tomorrow, that would be fantastic. But if um, uh, I think the uh, the point at which we've got um, a robot that can look after somebody with dementia in their own home, as, uh, as was boldly announced by the Sunday Express two years ago today, uh, uh, we're not quite at. Um, there's been particularly Japanese companies working on this concept of artificial intelligence and uh, and a robot that can uh, support people in those sort of, in those sorts of ways and I, and I think that's still um, it's probably not science fiction but I think it's a number of years I still think that's a number of years away um, but the uh, but in many other ways um, we are seeing um, technology changing uh, changing the way in which healthcare uh, is, is practiced uh, we've sort of been in the video that we just showed but um, the uh, uh, the NHS launched its uh, its first app to allow people to connect to to their GP about 18 months ago. That's now the most widely used um, uh, healthcare dedicated app in the world. So that, so there's definitely a demand out there, and we're seeing um, quite extensive now support for doctors um, in. Uh, in, in the treatment of patients. Um, we, saw, we saw some clips of digital surgery there. Um, I've been working with one company uh, who are taking that training in AI surgery and creating augmented reality actually in surgery so that when the surgeon is inside the body, the, uh, uh, the, the technology is watching the images and prompts the doctors mistakes that are frequently made at that point. Um, don't forget that there is a sponge behind the uh, behind the prostate, which you need to remember to take out sort of thing. So, so it's aware of where you are in surgery. So reducing errors and in, in healthcare, um, uh, the management of unwarranted variation is probably the single biggest issue. And we're seeing um, uh, the, the big takeoff now with online symptom checkers connected to the NHS. So when I log into my GP's app, my NHS GP's app, um, it'll ask me a bunch of questions and from that prompt, should I go to Boots or should I call 999 or offer me an appointment with a GP or an appointment with a nurse based on what I'm saying. So we're beginning to get that front end triage in quite a smart way uh, uh, moving forwards. So there's lots of use of technology um, and lots of people doing smart stuff as well. I, I have my mum and dad's Alexa programmed to remind them on the, to take their medications. So the the the, uh, the move of the Internet of Health things into people's homes we're see, uh, we're seeing coming, but we're not quite at the um, uh, uh, you don't need to go into medical training anymore because we have a robot to replace you. OK, so yeah, so it, it, it's, it's on its way, but there's still a, still a little bit of a way to go. And, and, and what um, other trends are you seeing in healthcare and 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 what, what makes you kind of think positively about the future in terms of the progress that we're making? Well, can we flip to the next slide? Um, we've. Um, I mean, I've, I've been talking a lot over the last uh, year or so to GPs about moving to increasingly um, digital um, uh, a digital approach to seeing patients and the convenience that that creates for many patients. Um, and it's been uh, the common theme up to 
three months ago from GPs was I didn't go to college for seven years to work in a call center um, and, and a lot of pushback. Um, suddenly with, uh, with the arrival of COVID-19, we flipped to uh, almost all um, consult GP consultations now being done online. And this is the, uh, this is a real app. This is the AccuRx uh, app where you can ring into your GP and you're having a telephone conversation. And if they want to move to face to face, uh, they just send you a link on your phone. You click on the link and it opens up in a video conferences. And this actually is because I, uh, when I pulled this off the internet, I realized I recognized the clinician. That's a guy called Mike Smith at the bottom, who is a GP in Camden in North London. So that's a uh, um, real GPs are using this extensively across the country now um, for being able to do those consultations without face to face. And the whole mindset has shifted. If you move to the next one, you'll see um, that we're using this now increasingly in hospitals as well. So in hospitals, we've created, uh, this is a company called Attend Anywhere, um, and this is uh, now used extensively across England and right across Scotland as well, where they can create a virtual uh, waiting room because part of the frustration of uh, doing video consultations for a hospital doctor was um, uh, you, you get your rheumatologist, your cardiologist, is has got a crackly picture of a patient at the other end uh, who says oh if you could just hang on doctor i'm just going to go and turn off my router and turn it back on again the, the bandwidth's a bit poor and it doesn't feel like a brilliant use of of the doctor's time well this application allows you to come into a waiting room check with somebody in the clinic that your video conference is working okay and then you will be called into the virtual room with the doctor at the appropriate time so that's beginning to look at a workflow um, and so we're seeing uh, a lot of those uh, th those sorts of tools um, appearing, but primarily um, in a uh, in, in a very in a very operational uh, way at the moment, addressing kind of the real pressures and needs um, that that that, that, we're, that are coming out of uh, the COVID nineteen for for um, remote consultations, and we're also seeing then after uh, what. In, is an interesting test bed because we're starting to see um, some of the uh, some of the problems that come from that which we can now start working around so for instance GPs have been telling me that they think that they're prescribing more antibiotics than they were because when a mum rings up with a child who's got um, uh, got an ear that hurts if they had the child in front of them they would look in the ear and they would know whether it's a wax build up and the uh, the prescription was drop some olive oil in it or whether it's an infection and the prescription would be antibiotics. Now they're, they're erring on the safe side. So we now need to think about what is the, what, what is the, um, the personal connection that has to be created uh, in order that for, for, uh, uh, for that to work. And we can see that this move to technology uh, is leaving a lot of people behind. So uh, people with mental health problems, the frail elderly, we can see it in the excess death numbers that uh, we found out what is working here. The real trick for the NHS now is not to go back to what happened before as we emerged from lockdown, but also uh, not to just assume we've solved it. But somewhere between what we have now and the next step forward is what a 21st century NHS needs to look like. Yeah, got you. And I think that concept of the, the virtual waiting room is one we're seeing being picked up by other industries as well, because they recognise there's maybe a little, as you say, a little bit of checking and workflow management that's important um, in order that people get the most out of their virtual experience. Um, now, I think some of a lot of the things you've described have talked about technolo technology being used wisely and effectively. You know, the next question I had is, you know, where else do you um, you know, see that in play where technology is being used in the right way and kind of really making a difference. Yeah, if we flip to the next slide, um, I think that the um, if you ask, it, is technology being used effectively uh, across healthcare? Um, I think you would say generally yes, it is. But is it anywhere near the limits of where it could be? Um, no, it's not. And tools like uh, like this. Um, uh, which are uh, wearable biosensor monitors um, that connect to um, big data in the sky that can track your uh, that can track your vital signs and send you uh, an alert in real time. So it can send a message back to you, the patient, to say um, 
you need to get up and walk around a bit and, and, and get, in, get, get your lungs moving because your O2 saturation level is down or um, we can see that your uh, your heart rate uh, is dangerously high for someone recovering from uh, heart surgery. You should ring your doctor, your GP now. Though that kind of um, technology to be able to do much more focused and much more continuous um, uh, support for patients it is an opportunity across hospitals and care settings, but also for people in their own homes and. There's a big philosophical change coming towards the NHS that it hasn't fully grasped that the sense of the NHS always being there for you uh, has really been caveated by the NHS is always there for you if you know you need it and reach out to contact them, which is why um, something that the that, that, uh, that doctors call the inverse care rule exists, whereby uh, quite frequently the highest users of the NHS are the people with uh, uh, with the lowest level of problems because it tends to be middle class people who are really good at knowing how to access the services and lots of people maybe if they don't have English as the first language or if they have mental health problems are not good at reaching out to the health service. Well we now have the technology to support people all of the time and for people to reach out for the NHS to be reaching out to patients who need it even when they don't need know they need it or are embarrassed to ask and so there's a big issue I think around real-time monitoring where the technology is there um, and the NHS hasn't fully grasped it. Um, I think the other opportunity is in the hard to reach areas. Um, are we facing the real targets? Part, what, one of the things that will come out of the learning uh, from, uh, from coronavirus is that um, the NHS responded brilliantly um, and uh, the hospital sector did pretty much everything that could be expected of it but 100% of the focus was on half of the problem because we now see that whilst um, we have uh, something like 40, uh, we have something like uh, 46,000 excess deaths over the last six weeks caused in some way by coronavirus and only half of them are in the hospital sector or just over half of them in the hospital sector. Very little has happened around um, nursing sector and the care sector and people in their own homes. So starting to, we have to come out of this with a sense of what does a resilient NHS look like and how do we provide the technology that can support somebody's mum in a nursing home who can't get into hospital and can't get to the GP and has been a little bit forgotten about. Um, and the other thing I think that's coming out of the question of are we using this effectively is that a lot of technology has been deployed without the thought process of, of why. So we had the Prime Minister announcing uh, that the other day that we would get to 200,000 tests uh, per day uh, for COVID. It's a, you have to ask the so what question because if all that means is that the worried well can get a uh, be tested over and over and over again to discover there's nothing wrong with them um, that's that's largely a waste of time if we can say that people in nursing homes and the people who work with people in nursing homes can be tested every two days and if they come up as infected this is exactly what they ought to do you can save lives and so I think that some of the effectiveness now that we have to focus on and for people coming into this as a tech uh, thinking that they're going to be technologists in in the health service the the so what question is the big question it's not does the technology work it's are we still applying uh, a 20 years old out of date view of how we run the health service as we bring in 21st century technology to it so so i think there is a lot to learn from uh, uh, from this yeah and, I, and that really resonates the the so what question i I've heard it put alternatively as the five whys. If you if you're doing something, ask why, and then to the answer, ask why, and really drill into what's the root cause and what's the problem that you're you're trying to solve. Um, just uh, conscious, we've probably got time for another one or two um, more questions on this segment. But just to remind people that there's the live uh, live event Q and A, uh, so the opportunity for you to ask questions so if you've got those questions please feel free to uh, type them into the uh, there's a question mark on the uh, menu and that will enable you to uh, submit some questions um i think we've, we've touched on a fair amount of um, technology and the disruption it brings um but 
looking ahead, you know, where are the main areas of future disruption you see and, and where do you think that might lead to opportunity? Uh, so I think that a, we are about to have the opportunity to significantly disrupt the way that health and care is delivered around the world. Um, I think there will be um, significant step forward in the use of, of artificial intelligence um, and machine learning and it's going to raise a real question about how do you test that technology. Um, if you use algorithms to predict something then if you put the same data in you would expect the same answer to come out every time and you can run uh, fairly simple uh, testing against to see if it works. Um, if you start to have a black box that is learning and you put the same data in two times and the answer comes out differently because it's learned from the previous answer, um, how do you test that? We're going to have to have a mechanism for um, for, for testing um, uh, the clinical decision support or even the person decision support that I access through an app to say, well, would it pass and would it pass a medical exam? If it's sat to be a GP, would it pass, at least in the field that it claims to be an expert in? So I think there's going to be huge disruption um, yeah, in that space. Um, and I think we will also see uh, big disruption in uh, in automation in the and if we just flip on to the next slide. Uh, you can see that, that that's a pretty picture of me, obviously, uh, but this is a company called Binner. Um, and whilst we've been looking at devices that you wear, this is an app that measures your, your heart rate, your respiratory rate and your oxygen saturation levels uh, just through the camera, uh, uh, through, through, through the camera. And if we flip on to the next one, um, this is kind of kind of scary. This, this automation. Uh, this is two technologies available on the NHS. The top one is something called Free Freestyle Libra, which is an automatic monitoring of your diabetes blood sugar levels. Um, and the second one down is another thing available on the NHS, which is automatically uh, adjusting your insulin. And this Dutch engineer, Liam Zebedee, hacked the two of them together to create what, um, what people are calling an artificial pancreas. The monitoring is automatic. The insulin adjustment is automatic. Why are people having to do the calculation themselves? And doctors don't know what to do with this now because they don't know whether it's safe. It's not been tested by anyone. But this opportunity to to automate the uh, uh, the adjustment between uh, uh, between monitoring and intervention is quite is, is, is a huge opportunity, but also quite threatening. How you test that and how you make sure it's safe and how you make sure it doesn't get hacked by somebody uh, are all big issues and are going to be massively disruptive in the next five years. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's uh, fascinating. Now, I'm, I'm conscious that I want to leave enough time for Q&A from the audience as well. So I'll, I'll probably just jump to my uh, last question for this segment um, and kind of link it back to the the school and education and the skills and talents that are needed by the healthcare sector in the future. I mean, you know, looking ahead, what are you looking for for people moving into the healthcare sector from, for example, the uh, the Northeast Futures UTC? Yeah, and I think it's a really good question. I mean, I was um, uh, early early in my career. I went through. I was CIO for one of the London teaching hospitals. Then I was chief executive of a hospital. And when that happened, I think I was the only the second person in the NHS's history to go from being a CIO to being a chief executive. It's much more common now. And the reason it's more common is that the connection of people, process and technology is coming together. And so I'd say if you're a technologist and you go into the NHS, and I suspect this is the same in most industries, if you want to be pure tech, you need to be brilliant. The, 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 there is always going to be a space for people who are absolutely at the leading edge who are focused on the technology, but there's not much space for the old the old type of IT manager. Now we're expecting all managers to be technology and data savvy. Um, and so the, the ability to think about your five watts question, to be able to think about a workflow, to be able to think about how you uh, uh, how technology will transform uh, the experience and the outcome for patients and for clinicians uh, is going to be the real challenge. So I'd say to uh, people that, uh, that that if you want to be a technologist uh, and you want to make a real difference and be at the top table, uh, be interested in policy, be interested in workflow design, be interested in change management as well, because the technologist who sits in a room and can only describe talk about the bandwidth of the, of the wireless network doesn't get invited to the most interested meeting, interesting meetings. 
Yeah, no, fantastic. And that that focus on the business context and the outcomes for patients or citizens or customers. I can, you know, that's you know, absolutely absolutely what we're seeing. That technology for technology's sake is becoming less and less relevant. So thanks ever so much for that, Matthew. I think we'll try and open up now. I think Tamana, are you going to um, moderate us through any kind of questions that are coming in? I can't hear you there, Tamana. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so I'm going to kick us off, Mark, with our first question. Um, we've talked a lot about healthcare. What advances are we seeing in social care and what are the big digital capabilities that could make a massive difference for social care? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. And, and when I talk about health, I talk about health and care, because when we're worrying about um, frail elderly people, when we're worried about um, uh, hard to reach people, we're often talking about uh, care homes, nursing homes and people who are in their own home who need to be uh, who need to be cared for. So um, I think that what we're going to see uh, is a couple of big changes digitally. One is the uh, the role of, um, if you like, the Internet of Health things, but connectivity into people's homes and into care homes becoming a significant part of monitoring. Um, we've seen uh, up in Liverpool, there is a pilot running at the moment um, with a piece of technology which does ambient health monitoring. You put it in your mum's room in a nursing home uh, and not only will it uh, track her heart rate and her respiratory rate, it's got a camera on it so you know whether the staff have been in there and give her a wash as well. So that kind of uh, 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 monitoring of quality will happen. The other thing that we're seeing is a big push together of health and care data um, so that when someone goes into their home, whether they're working in social care for a council or whether they are a, a district nurse in the NHS, they're looking at the whole of the person and trying to move away from this idea that five different people go into someone's house on a day and then they see no one for a week because they've gone in and they've done looked at their feet and checked what they're eating and uh, checked their heart rate and that they've gone in for all the different conditions. So we will see those coming together and as the technology supports decision making, it will be easier for people to work outside of the boundaries of, of their immediate skill. A physiotherapist will be able to do basic checking of, of, of vital signs and therefore a less, um, escalate to the respiratory nurse if they think that patient needs a visit. So the bringing together of health and care is, I think, will be one of the big learnings that comes out of uh, the pandemic that we're living through at the moment. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I wonder at this point if the uh, if there are any questions from the panel we have. OK, I guess uh, something that was going through my mind was how much we can learn from other countries and whether we would look to to any other uh, health services and say, you know, what they're doing is fantastic and we should we should be doing some of that ourselves. I think the uh, I, I think there is an uh, I mean, the NHS has always been terrible at learning. Um, and I used to, to say that um, uh, that if a supermarket discovered a better way of storing trolleys, then um, by the end of the week, every other supermarket would have would have stolen that idea and claimed it as their own. Whereas if a hospital found a better way of storing beds by the end of the week, every other hospital would have declared it unsafe. So that's that spread of knowledge is, um, can be uh, has historically been quite poor. I think the financial pressures the NHS has been under the last couple of years uh, ha has actually opened people's mind and we are seeing good ideas spreading. Um, but uh, as there's uh, questions come through here, which says to what uh, which talks about collaborating across other industries. And I think both inside the NHS and across industries, you're beginning uh, to see that uh, that uh, that happening. So the uh, people may pick this up in the newspapers, but the company who has built the data aggregation, big data aggregation layer, layer and the dashboards for tracking COVID spread across the country and the screens that you see on the daily press conference are coming from a company called Palantir. Palantir's background is in uh, is in security services. What they really do is monitor spies feed it, feedback into uh, uh, into the CIA and the FBI and MI5 and MI6. But they've taken that data platform because it is fantastic at security and lifted it across into health. And similarly, we have seen engineering companies 
with mixed success, try to move very quickly into the production of ventilators and the production of personal protective equipment. So uh, I, I'm hoping that one of the things that we will take out of this is that um, th this idea that uh, if you work for the NHS and you're paid for by the NHS, that's good. And if you work in the private sector, that's bad because public service is clearly now being defined by what you do, not who pays your salary. And, and, and the heroes of this are just as much people working in private nursing homes as they are working on NHS wards. And I, and I, and I think that will create much more of a sense of, share, of sharing and collaboration. Brilliant. Thank you, Matthew. Um, our next question, next question is a little bit more specific. Um, somebody is interested in understanding what sort of UX UI research precedes innovation in the NHS. Is there a philosophy for design led innovation? I don't know whether anyone from one well, of my Accenture colleagues wants to pick it up because I have a view on this, but Accenture actually did quite a lot of the UI uh, design for uh, for the NHS app when it was released. And I just don't know whether there's any any of my colleagues who were involved in that. Otherwise, I can talk about it. I, I wasn't Matthew, so I won't I won't riff it. <laughs> so, so yes, I'd have to say that if you go back four or five years, the answer would have been no. I think they um, the NHS recruited um, about four years ago um, a, a woman called Juliet Bauer, who spent two years heading up app development and so on for the NHS and came from a private sector background. She'd actually run the project that had taken the Times newspapers online and she completely changed the philosophy. So when the NHS app was being written, um, it was uh, there were a series of design teams of which one of them was a team inside Accenture uh, out actually testing with different user groups um, in order to improve the, U the UX and for the first time the NHS had a uh, started to produce UX experience uh, um, standards and so on. So that's um, uh, so yes, I think it's moving forward. I think there it's a big cultural shift for the NHS to not uh, just tell you what's good for you. That the 70 years practice of uh, being able to tell the public what's good for them, and only th only the last four or five years of thinking that they should listen a bit more. Um, but yeah, UX uh, uh, research and most of the people who worked on that have now spun off and have set up their own companies and are selling themselves back into the NHS as, uh, as, as user experience experts. It's, it's probably worth saying that that trend to user centric design um citizen centric design it is th that same movement from being a little bit reluctant and doing some things in quite a traditional way maybe five or six years ago has really changed and most big departments um, in the government are now adopting um user focused design and a focus and user experience and interviewing of um, citizens in order to then iterate when they produced a particular design and then make it better incrementally. Um, it, I wouldn't say it's perfect, but uh, I've seen it move a huge distance in a relatively small period of time. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. And just related to that question, we've got another question on how difficult is it to take digital innovation from the initial adoption to ensuring it is embedded as daily care practice? That's a that's a really great question, and it's 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 been really hard. Um, that uh, particularly the clinical professions um, have a view of how they work. Um, but I talked about GP saying I didn't spend seven years training to work in a call centre. Um, I uh, we uh, I've had hospital doctors say to me I didn't spend seven years at university to become a typist. I said, no, no, we want you to document the patient's medical records in an electronic note instead of a paper note. That has been the legal responsibility of, of doctors since way before the NHS was founded. So well, I have other people who type for me. Well, and so, so that challenge to historic working practices has been enormous and it's been enormous around the world. Um, and uh, what we've seen in the last 12 weeks is, is, is that just shift almost instantly. And what we don't know, and some of us are holding our breath on, is whether that it all tries to go back to like it used to be when, when we move back into a normal world, or whether we can take that step forward of GPs now discovering that because they do video consultations, 
they can use their day much more effectively and they get to go home and have their tea at six o'clock in the evening instead of their, their clinic running through into eight o'clock in the evening uh, with people having to wait for uh, wait, waiting in the waiting room. So change has been hugely difficult and that's why I, I'd say anybody who thinks you can solve problems just by deploying technology it's very, very rare that something like that goes viral across a system as complex as the NHS and as regulated as the NHS. You have to actually plan it into being. I don't want to lose the question on money um, that someone that, that someone's asked it, which is. Um, yes. So the question is, who actually installs and pays for technology for equitable healthcare delivery and how do we ensure a consistency? I think it may be bandwidth across the country. I, I, yeah, I, that's a question. I, I think I think this is a question. Two things. One is how do we avoid it being uh, the luxury for the rich, and secondly, how do we stop it from being um, all in the southeast of England, uh, uh, where the BBC will turn up and do a news piece on it? And I think both of them are good questions. So, what's been the, what has been shown around the world, um, and even in the American almost completely privatised health system, is a step change in technology requires an upfront investment by the government. Um, so uh, uh, the reason that uh, American healthcare is digitally ahead of the rest of the world by at least five years is because President Obama pumped money into the digitization of healthcare, uh, pumped money into private companies so they could digitize healthcare. And the reason that um, almost every GP surgery in England is paperless is because despite the fact that more than half of GPs are self-employed um, and run their own small businesses, the government paid for and continues to pay for the GPs to have IT systems because it's very hard, very hard. To, deli to deliver the cash back on, uh, on that investment in a short period of time. The quality gains are enormous, but it doesn't necessarily lower the cost. So on the whole, government pays for, um, for digital innovation. Um, which means that on the whole you are several years behind the leading edge and what ha what tends to happen is that the basics are funded and then you get small outbreaks of innovation going on by the people who, who, who are good at asking the question but the drive to get us to um, all of our nursing homes uh, connected up with Wi-Fi, with monitoring in everybody's uh, by everybody's bed, is going to require a central government in investment across the country. The companies that run care homes are not going to be able to fund be able to fund that. Um, so that uh, and the need to make sure that it spreads across the whole of the country is something that the NHS focus on a lot. In fact, I'd say the NHS frequently doesn't do things that it ought to do because it's worried about creating inequalities. Um, and we've been spent, uh, we spend a lot of time, and in fact, Accenture has been working a lot on if digital is going to become a big part of healthcare, how does it stop a widening of health inequalities? Because all the people on this call uh, will be delighted to be able to access their doctor uh, using, uh, using a computer. But my, my mum and dad in their 80s, don't find that so easy. So where are the digital navigators? Where can they go to help to get access to those services? Um, and, and, and you have to build it in both in a geographical fairness way and also um, rich to poor, native English speakers to non-English speakers, the digitally savvy to the non-digitally savvy, people who have a, um, a, a smartphone with unlimited um, uh, with unlimited minutes and, and, and unlimited data versus people who are on a pay-as-you-go contract. All of these things are blockages to people being take, being able to take advantage of this and all things that the NHS and social care have to plan into any sort of technological revolution. Excellent, thank you very much. I'm just conscious of time now, so I'm going to hand back to Mark to lead us into the closing session with Michael. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm not sure how much leading in we'll need. I know conscious of time, we've got um, just a couple of minutes left and I'm respectful of uh, of people's time. I'd, I'd just like to thank Matthew for that, for fielding all those uh, questions. It was pretty quick fire. Uh, I hope everyone agrees that was also um, really enlightening and kind of relevant to us now, but back to the kind of purpose around, around this discussion. It's a forward looking discussion around what can be enabled and the role of tech uh, technology and healthcare and the confluence of those two things which is absolutely then at the, the heart also of what the utc is looking to achieve so 
Thanks again, Matthew, and I'll I'll hand on now just for closing comments uh, to Michael. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> so thank you very much, everyone, for joining what I think has been a very stimulating and interesting discussion. I'd also like to thank Matthew um, for giving us the benefit of his depth of knowledge in, in this area um, and thinking slightly differently, perhaps, than the NHS has done in the past. I'd like again to thank the Accenture team, Mark, Chris and Tamana uh, for putting this on. Um, I very much hope that you've enjoyed um, the session. It's highly likely we shall, we shall be doing another one of these shortly and we'll be in touch about that. Um, but meanwhile, thank you all very much. <laughs>